Good morning and welcome to the 11 o'clock slot on uh, D-Trace and Analytics presented by Brian Cantrell. I think you're going to enjoy this slot. Every year there's a, a presenter that causes the um, IT staff a little bit of a problem in terms of you know, disappearing for a month or you know, not answering a few emails or not getting to deadlines on time. This year that distinction goes to Brian. But um, he's a very energetic person and he's a good for a morning talk. He has once been described as Tigger on speed, so I hope you enjoy the show. Uh, thank you, Doug, for that introduction. I'm, I, I'm not sure. Um, that feels like my first kindergarten report card, you know, energe energetic being used strictly as a euphemism um, for various pathologies. Um, Good morning. Uh, I'm Brian Cantrell from Sun Microsystems. I am, I guess, the problem child at least 2009, for, my, for which everyone has my profound and profuse apologies. Uh, so this morning I'm going to, and there's actually not a slide up here because um, this is going to be a very demo-intensive presentation, um, but if you've wondered what presentation you've wandered into, uh, this morning I'm going to give a presentation on visualizing D-Trace. And before I get started, because it's kind of implied in the title, um, if I could, and I'm, I don't, I'm not doing this for purely self-aggrandizing reasons, but how many of you have heard of D-Trace? How many of you know what D-Trace is? Okay, that's, that's, that's great. That's, this is the, the pinnacle of the fame that I will ever achieve, is that a room full of fellow super nerds recognizes the technology that I developed. That's about the end of the line for me. Um, that's, that's, that's great. How many of you actually have used D-Trace? That's, boy, that's terrific. Um, how many of you have used D-Trace to actually solve a problem? Okay, well, um, a smaller number of you. Uh, okay, so just, just a quick aside, D-Trace is a workhorse, not a show horse. So, uh, I mean, it's great that you've, if you've seen D-Trace and every once in a while, ah, I love D-Trace. Well, have you used it? Well, no, not really, but it just seems great. Um, you should use D-Trace to, to solve your problems. That's what it's designed to do. It's not designed to just kind of be cool or recognizable or what have you. It's designed to actually solve your problems. And indeed, you will find that your disposition towards D-Trace changes the first time you actually use it to solve a problem. And those of you who've actually used D-Trace to solve a problem can attest to this. Uh, and I had this experience myself in developing D-Trace. The first time that D-Trace saved my ass was a, it's a fundamental shift uh, that you have from, wow, this technology seems interesting, it's something to play with, to, wow, this technology is something that is really essential to my day job. And if you are, if you are a systems administrator uh, and you've got D-Trace on some of your systems, be they Mac OS X or Solaris or FreeBSD, I uh, really encourage you to actually use them uh, in anger. Use D-Trace in anger. That's what it's designed to do. And just to give you a, a little bit of the history of D-Trace, the reason that D-Trace is effective for solving problems, or we believe anyway, is because we actually designed D-Trace to solve our problems which seems like a kind of a stupid thing to say, but the reality is there's a lot of software tooling out there, a lot of software infrastructure out there that was not developed by the people who intended to use it. And I think that the best infrastructure, the best tools in particular, are always developed by those who actually need them. And a lot, a lot of you have a kind of tools groups or people focusing on tools research or what have you, if they're not actually using the tools, the tools they end up developing end up being show horses, not workhorses. And we very much needed D-Trace to solve our problem. What was our problem? Well, I, I came to Sun uh, 13 years ago uh, to work with Jeff Bonwick and the Solaris Performance Group. And the problem that we had was pretty simple. We didn't know why the system sucked. And worse, the sucking is not some persistent phenomenon. The system would start sucking and then stop sucking. Which, on the one hand, it's like, all right, great, the system no longer sucks. But if you're actually trying to understand why the system sucks, that transient nature to the problem is absolutely brutal. And this was hit home for me uh, when I first started, uh, first came to work for Sun, 1996. We were looking at a, uh, a benchmark rig. This is actually the, in, the, in the winter of 1997. And we had just released a machine called the E10K. Um, now, I, I don't want to see a show of hands on the E10K because Let's face it, we all have very mixed feelings about the E10K. If you, uh, there's a lot of love and, and some pain with the E10K. Um, but the E10K was a very exciting machine. It was a 64 processor machine. 
Um, S true SMP machine, and there were a lot of great, great things about the E10K, really, really essential uh, to Sun's rise, uh, maybe fall, but certainly rise uh, in, in the late 90s. So we had just shipped the 64 processor machine, and I was looking at a benchmark run. And, we were, we, and we, these guys were doing a huge benchmark run uh, up in Beaverton, Oregon. And they had a serious sucking problem. They, uh, they were running this benchmark, and the benchmark would run like a champ. And then all of a sudden, it would stumble, and the sucking would start. And it would last like four minutes. I mean, the system would be frenetically sucking. And then it would stop. And the system would go back to running like a champ. And they could see, based on the throughput they were getting during the periods in which it was running properly, that we were on track to break the world record for this particular benchmark. But the periods of sucking was the difference between first and worst. They had an unpublishable number with, with these periods of sucking. They didn't understand what was going on. So they got us involved in Solaris Performance. And at this point, I had never seen an E10K. They're just too expensive. That we, we didn't have one in our lab. Uh, and these guys didn't have one E10K for this benchmark. They had five of them. These are five E10Ks racked out, 64 processors, 64 gigs of DRAM. It is, it is telling to me that 12 years after the fact, the specs of that machine are still non-trivial. Your laptop does not have 64 processors and 64 gigs of DRAM, not yet anyway. But the, those machines, you can imagine in 1997, those machines were, they were Goliath. They were huge machines. And with, it was uh, one, one machine, one 64 processor E10K to actually run the benchmark, uh, one to run the Oracle database, and three to drive load onto it. And so we started looking at this machine, and the tooling that we had was incredibly primitive at the time. Uh, at the time, actually, the only real tooling we had was a, a tool that Jeff had developed, in, Jeff Bonwick had developed in Solaris 2.6, called Lockstat. And if you use Lockstat, um, Lockstat was kind of a shard of light into pitch black, really just a shard, though. Uh, and we were having to use it to try and understand the system. Um, and it was really difficult because we, wouldn't, we couldn't really explore hypotheses. We could get some amount of data out of the system, but to actually explore a hypothesis, I had to write a custom kernel module and throw it onto that machine. Now, if you have an E10K or had an E10K back in the day or know of an E10K or if you've got a big machine today, uh, you know that booting is not a real strength. <laughs> Those machines took kind of a while to boot. At the time, they took about 90 minutes to boot. So loading a kernel module onto the machine is not really tenable. So what I was doing was I was dynamically loading kernel modules. I was, I was dynamically substituting kernel modules that were being very dirty about the way they were, they were instrumenting the system and just hoping to God that I got it right. Because if I didn't, the system would panic and I would have like an hour and a half to go figure out why I'm such an idiot. Uh, and everyone could kind of twiddle their thumbs while I generate a new kernel module that fixed whatever bug we just run into. Um, and it w the progress was very, very slow, very frustrating as a result of doing this. And, uh, but, so what was the problem? Well, as, as we were digging deeper and deeper in the problem, it was clear that we were going quadratic in the networking stack. Order of n squared, actually, it was, as I recall, it was like order of n to the fourth in the networking stack. And we found an easy way to reduce that to order of n squared. Great. Um, and, we, and we kept digging and digging and digging to, to understand what the problem was. And as we got deeper, we would discover, for example, we were order of n squared or order of n to the fourth. But this is a list that should never have more than like four things on it. So why did it have a thousand things on it? Okay, well, yet more custom kernel modules. Dig, 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 dig. And all along, we're getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And my assumption the entire time is that when we get to the final answer here, it's going to be deep in the bowels of the networking stack. There's going to be something, something imperfect, suboptimal about the implementation. We're going to switch that, and that's going to be the problem. And boy, was I wrong. Because when we, when we got to the end, when we finally figured out what the problem was, what was the problem? The problem was that the, the machine had been misconfigured. It had been misconfigured to act as a router. <laughs> Etsy no default router was not set. And they were seeing sporadic router failure elsewhere in the lab. Router would pop, and the world's slowest, most expensive router would volunteer <laughs> to start routing packets. So the benchmark machine would furiously start routing packets between all these other machines. And it sucked at being a router. You're not a router. Do not route packets, please. But why was this so horrifying? Because the ultimate, why was this set? Why had they not set it correctly? Because weeks prior, when they were trying to get things working, they, only this machine had a route. They had another router problem somewhere else. And they, they, had, they, they had effectively configured the machine to act as a router, albeit briefly, and forgot to undo that. <laughs> 